Now it's time to hear the stories of Utes in their own words. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Here's your host, Mike Legaschult. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show as we get things underway in the month of August for 2020. Thanks for joining us. Well, it is time to turn our attention to football. As the Pac-12 Conference announced last week that it is going to hopefully get a 10-game conference-only schedule underway on September 26th. That means in mid-August, teams will hopefully be able to start training camp. And, you know, it's really hard to have any kind of a lengthy conversation about Utah football without mentioning the name of the guy who will be our guest today. Ron McBride, as the Utah head coach from 1990 until 2002, is really the guy who laid the foundation for everything that's happened in the last 30 years in Utah football history. Obviously, Urban Meyer came in here in 2003 and 04. He had that magical season in, in 04 with the Fiesta Bowl birth of the undefeated season. Cal Whittingham took over for Urban and has carried on that success with an undefeated season of his own in 2008. Back-to-back Pac-12 South Division championships the last two years. But really, everything that's happened with Utah football, as we know it, started with Ron McBride. And when he came in, The program really had no track record of sustained success. In fact, they had just five winning seasons in the previous 16 years before McBride came in and took over. They had not had a winning season in the WAC since 1985. McBride comes in in year two. They go seven and five. They make a bowl game in 92, the same in 93. That 1994 team was the first 10-win team in school history as they went to the Freedom Bowl and took down Arizona in a great matchup as Utah finished top 10 in both the coaches and the AP poll that year. And what a great run it was for Ron McBride. In fact, over 70 players he coached uh, at Utah and other places, played in the NFL, and, and uh, of course he was a big part of the drive that built rice Eccles Stadium in 1998. Before then, he used to play an aging Rice Stadium, and uh, he was uh, one of the guys who really had a lot to do with just uh, the growth of the Utah program and the athletics program overall. And uh, it'll be fun to catch up with him. That's one of the things I like about this podcast is we have a chance to really dig into the how and the why, not just the what. And so I want to talk to Ronnie about really, you know, after being an assistant coach at Utah a couple times, what he saw in this place that led him to take the head coaching job when he did in 1990 and and really what his blueprint was for success and and how he turned things around and and just get some some uh, great memories from Ronnie on some of the guys he coached and and worked with and his relationship with uh, Lavelle Edwards the former BYU coach and just a lot to talk about should be a fun interview Ronnie Bry former Utah head football coach coming up in just a moment on Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts search for them on iTunes Spotify and YouTube. Now, back to more of Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. Well, so pleased to be joined by one of the all-time greats in Utah athletics history, the man who really built the football program that we've all come to know and love today, Ron McBride, former head coach of the Utah football program from 1990 to 2002. And uh, Coach Mack, appreciate you hopping on. I know for a guy who is quote-unquote retired, you are as busy as ever with your foundation, and we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. But how's your summer been so far? Oh, good. You know, it's been, you know, this with the pandemic thing, it makes a little restricted, but uh, I'm still able to do a lot of, a lot of things. You know, I, I, this, my foundation thing has been really huge and we've been, you know, been meeting with the um, different school districts. You know, we, we had a couple of meetings up with the Ogden school district and we had, I uh, have had several meetings with James Yippus and the Salt Lake City School District, and so we've we we kind of have our our finger on what's on on what's going on in the school districts and um, and how our money's being spent. So and then uh, been doing some stuff with Juan Diego, the, the defensive lineman of Juan Diego, just on Tuesdays and Thursdays, go out work at technique with them. Yeah. And, uh, and and then you know just uh, staying pretty close to home most of the time. Yeah, I, I know you are a guy who's been very active, and uh, obviously with uh, the coronavirus and the challenges of that, I know doing a golf tournament can be tough, and just getting out and about can be tough. So it's good to hear you've stayed busy and are finding ways to still be involved. You know, coach. Before we get into your your background with Utah program and how you built this thing, and, you know, first question I want to get to you on is kind of the, the topic of the day and, and the challenges of being a college football coach in this era of 
the coronavirus. And the schedule now is finally set for the youth starting on September 26th. But I think even that, uh, you know, it might not happen on time. As, as, you know, as a guy who's been in that chair of Kyle Whittingham and others before where you're trying to get your team in just for workouts and plan a season and, and, and sort of put a team together, you know, what would be going through your mind at this point to deal with all these challenges that these guys are facing in this current day and age? Well, it, it, it's just uh, your, the leadership of your athletic department is really important. And I think there has to be a plan in order. Uh, and there has to be a backup plan. It has to kind of be an A, B, and C plan. Right. And it, it appears to me that they do have an A, B, and C plan. You know, and they've made some they've made some important decisions uh, about the preseason games and and a, and a ten game schedule, which is which the schedule looks really good. It's an exciting schedule. Uh, I have a big concern about the California schools. You know whether they'll even be able to compete just because of the amount of, of the pandemic in California. And I, I would say that is a little bit up in the air at this point. I'd agree with that. Yeah. And so, and let's say the four California schools can't play, then, then it puts a whole new ball game out there. I know they have a contingency for each. And I know that, that uh, they had a big meeting on Sunday uh, with with Harlan and Kyle and and the pack, you know the Pac-12 uh, over the, of the each issue that's come up and uh, they're pretty much staying on top of it. So it's 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 a it's a tough time. But I I will tell you that that I was I've been up to the facility a couple of times. You can't go in the building, but I had. I had to pick some stuff up and drop some stuff off and uh, just seeing the kids coming out of the facility, the players look really in good shape. They look, they look trim, they look fit. You know, it's a good looking crew of kids. And I think that, that the, this recruiting class uh, of young players, I think is really good. And uh, I, I, I think, the, and I think with Doug Alisai, he knows exactly what to do with a strength coach, and and, and uh, he's on top of what he has to get done. And Cyrus, the academic guy, he knows exactly what has to be done. And the uh, the coaches know exactly what has to be done. So everybody seems to be pretty much on top of what what needs to be done. You know, I mean, there's no guesswork over there about what has to be done. Nope, you make some great points. I agree. The plan has been very thorough by Utah for plan A, B, and C. And everyone I've talked to has said, hey, the workouts have gone pretty well. Uh, we feel like we've got the, the, the environment as safe as it can be. The, the problem is, as you mentioned, kind of at the, the opening of your answer there, is you've got to play somebody. And if you have four schools in California, maybe even the two in Arizona who are having issues just to open their facilities, it's going to be hard to get this schedule in, even though in your local area and your campus you might be just fine so that's that's one of the biggest challenges is is who do you play and and as you mentioned a lot of moving parts so um yeah some great insight from you coach on, on just what you've seen at the facility uh i want to get into kind of the your background with utah football if i can ronnie and and uh one of the great things i like about this podcast is we not just talk about what's happened but also kind of the how and the why and and uh, right. in your 13 years at Utah from 1990 to 2002, you know, you came in and took over a program that had just five winning seasons the previous 16 years. It was not a winning program that, uh, you know, had a lot of success, uh, a lot of hits and misses, you know, before you, you took over and, and uh, you came in and, and brought stability and you brought a plan and, and you really laid the foundation for what's happened under Urban Meyer and Kyle Winningham. So I, I want to kind of go back to the beginning for you, coach, with your, your time at Utah. You were an assistant coach at the U under both Wayne Howard and Jim Fossil. You were here from 97 to 82 under Wayne Howard. And then you came back under Jim Fossil from 85 to 86. So you had a little bit of background with this program. You came from Arizona, worked under Dick Tomey, and we'll talk about Dick and some other guys you worked under in a bit, but you knew the Utah program enough where you weren't blind coming into this. So based upon what you knew and what you thought you could do as the Utah head coach, what attracted you to the Utah head coaching job when you took over in 1990? 
Well, first of all, the 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 uh, uh, when I was there as an assistant coach, I could tell that that Utah was a sleeping giant. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just it just it 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 just hadn't been managed well. You know, I mean, from uh, you know throughout the years, everybody was looking for a quick. What what coaches were looking for it seemed to me was a quick fix. You know, get her, be able to get a few wins and then get a better job. Yep, in and out. You know, and then, uh, and so what I saw when I was there as an assistant, I said this place could be could be really big time. I mean, it could because you had all the things you needed to be big time. You know, in other words, you you could really. And I had in my mind when I was an assistant coach, okay, if that if if I ever had an opportunity to be a head coach. This would be a place I wanted to to be because I I'd, I'd been in six programs previous to that that were complete losers and we made them complete winners mm-hmm. and it, it appeared to me that Utah was the easier easier than all of those you know and so it's just a matter of having a you know I had I had a plan when I took the job and it wasn't a short it was a long term plan you know. And then it would take at least three years to to start to turn the program correctly and to recruit it correctly, and it wouldn't happen overnight. And you had to have patience and figure that hey, this is going to be a, a job that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stay at for as long as I can. And because this thing, if if, if built correctly, can become a really really national football football program. You know, Coach Mack, you mentioned your plan, and every coach I talk to about building a program says it comes down to the three things, recruiting, recruiting, and recruiting. And, and then uh, your staffing obviously is um, important in developing those players and bringing them to your program. But you, you mentioned the, the recruiting aspect. You came in uh, to Utah as a head coach with a plan. You were here before. You knew what this could be in terms of attracting recruits. You know, we're, we're close to California. You did a great job bringing kids in from Hawaii and and uh, developing the, the Polynesian pipelines, it's now called. In terms of recruiting, what was your plan to get kids here and, and make them happy to be here? Well, the, the plan in recruiting was first, first and foremost is you had to make sure that you're going to have a good missionary program. Yep. In other words, so, you, you know, and we had to establish the fact that 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 we were the the missionaries were really going to be important to us because a certain segment of your football team had to be kids that were going on missions and were going to be coming back from missions and so you had to have you had to recruit a player that was he's not going to he's not going to help you for 3 years right you know and the idea was to get the kids on their missions as soon as possible and get them out and not use up their freshman year or not use up a number on them. And so we had to kind of bank players, which was a little, you know, you take, you're taking some chances. You might not get them back. Right. Because you can't hold them to a scholarship. But so we, we invested in that program and we, we had to build our numbers up. We, we couldn't, have numbers going out with missionaries, you know, counting them in the numbers. <clears throat> so we had to figure a way to do it. And then we were going to have, we were going to have a third, a third and a third as far as, as far as uh, uh, how we were going to, we were going to have a, a third Polynesian, a, a third, a third Afro and a, and a third white was going to be the football team. It was going to be uh, in, and we were going to go to areas of the country that knew where we could in uh, where we could get those players. And the first thing that I, you know, when when we kind of looked across, I said, um, I want to get some guys in here that football is is their life. That's what they do, mm-hmm. and I'll ma- I'll make them get a get an education. You know, but I want guys that are football football nuts. You know that they love the weight room, 
They love to work out. They love to play. You take the game away from them, you're taking their life away from them. And so when guys would, you know, we went into Mississippi because those kids in Mississippi, they love football. You know, it's like a yep. passion. We went into Georgia. We, and these places, I'd all, I'd been at those places and worked camps in those places over the years. And, uh, Greg McMacken had a good, had a good, uh, line into Mississippi, into Georgia, you know, into those, those areas. And plus I'd worked camps in those areas uh, years before. And so I knew coaches down there. And so we kind of went in and then we had one little section of Florida that was kind of from, from Miami it goes along a, a small road that goes down through through Glade State, Florida and that and up in the Sarasota. So we, we kind of recruited that, that line. And then, um, obviously, uh, to get into, to Hawaii, American Samoa, Tonga, you know, those areas. And we had to establish ourselves in, in, in Hawaii as being a major, a major player. And it took us maybe our third year. We hit a home run because we got out of, there was that, I think my third year, there was 12 or 13 great, absolutely great players in Hawaii. And we ended up getting seven of them. Wow. And that was, and we beat all, we, we beat Alabama. We beat, we beat Washington. We beat Colorado. We beat all these, all these, all these really good teams. And we tied, we did a great job of tying that whole group of players together as one. In other words, one, one fell, the next one fell, the next one fell, the next one fell, because they all were guys that knew each other. And we, we tied them all into one group. And, you know, so, and we always had every week we had a different coach in, in Hawaii, you know, it's, it, in, in being there for that week. So we had a week, we kept our presence in there all the time. So we're always, we're always there. We're always where we needed to be. And, and, um, so we, we got that. And then we recruited, uh, California for a lot of the skill kids and, and some kids out of Arizona, some out of Vegas. But that was California was largely where we were getting our skill guys from. Right. And, uh, Utah, you could, you could, you could get really good linebackers out of Utah. You could, could get good D linemen, you know, could get offensive linemen, you know, and then we were able to, uh, you know, find a, a, a Luther Ellis, you know, in a small place or, a, you know, some of these really great players that because we, we were pretty efficient at what we were doing recruiting wise and we had good, and we had good recruiters and we had guys that knew the country. You know, as you talk coach and especially at that time, Utah wasn't getting a lot of the, the top blue chip recruits. You had to kind of get guys who you thought would develop in the program and you really had to get them to buy in to what you were doing. You weren't able to sell, Hey, we've won X amount of whack championships. Come play for us. You know, you didn't have some things in terms of the tangible results to sell like maybe a BYU did or some other programs did at that point. So you really had to sell them on something. And if I'm hearing you right, it seemed like the the family aspect, uh, the commitment to each other aspect and, and uh, a chance to, to build something were some things you could maybe sell. Maybe just talk about, you know, when you were trying to, to get this program built and attract the players from Florida in California and get into Hawaii and get guys to come in, as you mentioned, what, what was sort of your message to recruits as you built this thing back in those early days to get them to look at Utah and give you a chance? It, you know, it was really the family effect, mm-hmm. you know, of, of bringing, of bringing guys uh, together for one cause, you know, and to build something special. And that was the whole thing. I said, Hey, we're going to build something special here and this is how we're going to do it. And, and you guys are the people that are going to do it. And if you want to, if you want to take a chance and you, you want to be part of something that could be really special, that this is a good place for you to come. And, uh, we had a, a, our kid, our, our players on campus did a good job of recruiting the kids. And, um, you know, and we did a good job of, 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 
of finding of finding the right type of player who fit what our vision was, you know, and in and, and uh, we done it. We you know we done it at all these different places, and you just find out what your weakness is, and then you have to make make the weakness become a strength, mm-hmm. and you. And you can't worry about the deficiencies. If you worry about the things you don't have, that'll like, like, you know, will just take everything away from you. So if you worry about what you can't do, then you're not going to succeed. So what you do is say, okay, here's, here's our problems over here. We solve, we're going to solve those. Just, just, we're going, we're always going forward. We're not taking a backward step. And, um, the idea was to build the defense first because nobody played defense in the league except, except BYU. BYU always played good defense. That's a great point. They were known for their passing, but they were great defensively. Yeah, they had good defensive players, and they were, they were well coached on defense. And so we were going to take our best personnel and put them on defense. And we were going to recruit defensive players that, that were – you know, we're just, that's what they did. You know, that's all they thought about was just playing football and, and, and develop a physical mentality with that group. And the offense was going to be, was going to be safe and consistent and just try to play mistake free football and be a little bit vanilla, but be, be physical and try to have a good kicking game. But, the third, the third, by the time the third year should, should come, we should be good on offense, good on defense and good on special teams. And we should be ready to, to win a championship and start going to bowl games. And so that's, and that's kind of how it, how it went. Yeah. So the, the plan and it, you know, and I always told everybody, I said, just stay with the plan. Don't panic, you know, and keep pushing these players. And, and, uh, and so we just we just kind of took our time, and the the more games that we won, the more people did for us. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you the building that stadium was huge. Yes, you know that was that was that was. If they had to built that stadium, it would we we'd have never we won't would not be where we are today. No, nope. and that that was that was huge, and then. And then getting the, uh, uh, you know, the, bu- the bubble we had for an indoor practice facility back there was huge. Uh, uh, you know, the, the weight room that the, the Smith, uh, Richie Smith and that family built, you know, was, was big time. And so the, the more you won and the more people could see that you're going to go forward, the more they wanted to invest in what you were doing. And so it got better because, you know, as we got better on the field, you know, people could see, okay, yeah, this is turning. And then they got more excited about what you're doing. It all came together, as you mentioned, in uh, 1991, your second year, seven and five. A year later, you go to the Copper Bowl. So, as you said, kind of year two, three, four, um, your plan came together. Before we talk about specific years, I want to go back a little bit more to your background. And, and Ronnie, you, you see the hires made across the country now as – is a lot of schools go for the, the young guy to be their head coach. When you came into Utah, you've been an assistant coach for around 25 years. I mean, you've been around to the various places. You worked under some other coaches. You were a guy who really put the time in, and I, I think your experience from all those various stops and, and working under various people really is what helped you do what you did at Utah. And a couple of guys you've talked about before are Dave McLean. You coached under him at Wisconsin from 83 to 84. And unfortunately he passed away of, of, of a heart attack in 86 and, and, but did a great job at Wisconsin. And then also Dick Tomey is a guy you worked under at Arizona from 87 to 89 before he came to Utah. I know those two guys were very influential to you, just talk about what you you took from those two guys, and maybe some others you worked with that specifically helped you as the head coach at Utah and build the program you were able to build in your your thirteen years here. Well, first of all, you know I worked I worked for Wayne Howard for thirteen years, and and Wayne was a great builder of programs, you know, because we we I was we I coached with him at, at Gavilan Junior College in Gilroy. And we won the small, we, we played for the small college championship, I think in my, 
second or third year, and we had we had great teams. Yeah, and and we and we had control of a lot of things on campus. We had control of the financial aid. We had control of the jobs on campus. We had control of of a lot of things, and we had a president that really wanted to be successful. Mm-hmm. And we and we only brought people from the outside to play that that could act, make an impact in our program. And so we we kind of you know we recruited a little bit from the outside and a little bit from other districts, but you know we only took players that we needed to fill were, were a weakness we had in the program. And we built that program just on the local kids. We took some kids out of San Jose and then we had uh, a group of kids from, from uh, different parts of, we had the first group of Hawaiian kids. We bought in, we bought in four from Hawaii. We had, we had a really great tailback that, that came out of, uh, uh, was from from Ohio. We had a linebacker came out of Ohio. These guys were all big time players. They weren't just good players. But they were big time players. You know, they were real guys. Yeah, and, and guys that we had we had that we had seen play, and we had contacts with their coaches. And then we went to uh, a place called UC Riverside, and UC Riverside had never won a league game in the history of of the school. They, I mean, they were. They were worse than bad, <laughs> and and, and, um, and so we took a look at what the weaknesses were. They didn't even have a weight room there. Oh I mean, my goodness! Just, I mean, it was like it was like starting from square one. Yeah. So there was about seven players on campus that were really good players, and then we took we took two, I think, three players out of out of Gavilan. Guys that were really good. And then we took we took two guys out of San Francisco City College who, who both ended up playing pro ball for a long time. And then we recruited again. We we got heavily into the Polynesian culture. We recruited the Carson area where all of the Polynesians were. And we had uh, Louis Fiatoa who was already on campus, but his brother Kise was a was a, a not a good player but a great player and we got him a, away from UCLA and away from uh Arizona Arizona State because his parents wanted him to go where his brother was and but this kid had no way that he was going to come to a place like UC Riverside <laughs> and and um and then Kise brought another group of guys with him because he was the team leader at at uh, at Car- and Carson, and so he brought four or five guys with him, and uh, and the the uh, the two guys we brought out of out of out of Frisco were great, you know, great players, and the kids we brought out of Gavlin were the very best players we had, and so we we built this thing overnight, really. Yeah, and just it just. Uh, uh, and we had a bunch of guys that loved to play, and uh, we had tough guys. And we, with that, with that group at UC Riverside, we beat four Division One football teams. We are Division Three football team. Wow! And we, and we traveled on a yellow bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our, and our, our guys used to come in coveralls. We'd always dress them down so they looked bad. Oh my goodness. So, so we let them wear anything they wanted. To, right? <laughs> so we show up in our yellow bus. I remember, I remember we were playing Long Beach State, and all the Long Beach State guys just came out of their hotel, right? And they had their suits on with their nice ties and everything. Uh-huh. And here we show up in our yellow bus. And our guys are getting out, you know, and and they got their coveralls on. And and I and I would say to the players, I said. See those guys? They all got a lot of money. You guys got <laughs> nothing, you know. And, and but this is your day to, for the poor to take down the rich. Right? <laughs> and, and and so we we beat Long Beach State that day, and and uh, and physically we beat the really beat the crap out of them. You know, we physically we just really dominated them. And of course they fired. They fired the head coach, and then we took the Long Beach State job 
uh, the next year. Right. But and then we beat had beaten UNLV on the road, um, Cal State Fullerton on the road. You know all these Division One programs, and and so we walked in. And every everybody about halftime they figured out that we were for real. You know so, but but they, these kids were good, were really good players, and we had, I think we had something like seven or eight draft choices out of that, you know, out of that program. Wow. And then, and then we went to Long Beach State. And then we took, we took our four best players from Riverside and brought them to Long Beach. And that's, it was Russ Bollinger and Danny Bunce and, uh, Dean Morali, I think, and, 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 uh, one of the whiteouts. So we took our fr- our four best kids at UC Riverside and they came to, they came to Long Beach. And then Long Beach was a really, uh, interesting situation because they had they had recruited uh, and they had a real division in their football program between the kind of the the, the African American players and the white players. You know, there was a real real division, and that and that was kind of when all that was really going on. You know, it's really common in in the mid seventies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so we had a really split kind of football team, and we had to we had to change that whole culture. And there was a couple of players that were getting paid by boosters, and and it was just it was you know it was a mess really. Yeah, and so so we had to try to survive the first year, you know, when we took the job, and we. We we took a program that had, I, I think they were three and eight when we took it, and, and we ended up six and five. I think the first year, and, and believe me, that, that was one of the hardest coaching jobs you ever want to have, just to get all those guys to play together and and to get them to do things the right way, you know, in the classroom. And I mean, it was a hard group to manage. Yeah. And then the second and third year, we, we were really good. I mean, we were really good. We were tough. We were athletic. You know, we have recruited well, and and again, you know, we we done well with the Polynesian kids. We had a good group of of, of African American players, and we had a really good group of white of of white players, and and we we kind of gone recruit a lot of you know JC kids, but from only from junior colleges where where we had contacts with the head coach and we only took the guys that that they knew were our type of players and so we'd say we go go up to uh, any of any of the schools in the San Jose area any like like uh, uh any whether it be Foothill Junior College or or De Anza Junior College or any of those places where where guys that I played with in, in college were, were head coaches. Like, okay, who's the toughest guy you got who loves to play football, who's a little bit wacko? <laughs> you know, who, 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 who is that guy? Yep. And, that, and, and that, that I can manage him, you know? And um, uh, so we, we were able to, to, uh, to to build around what they what they had, and and with guys that you know thought similar to the way we thought, and then we were able to turn that program completely around, and that's when we took the uh, the Utah job. You know they uh, so they came out and got you know they sent a guy out to to recruit Wayne Howard, and uh, and so. When we first, when we first went to Utah, man, it was that there was there wasn't a lot of good players there, mm-hmm. and and they had no weight room. They had a, all the weights were laying on the floor down in the bottom of the building, right? <laughs> and I said, Where, where's, where's your weight room? Right. And, and so we ended up. Uh, they dropped the wrestling program, and so we were able to to build a weight room up on the, uh, the second floor of the hyper building and, and get, a, get ourselves a really good strength coach. And, 
and 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 then we brought four kids from Long Beach State that were that were really our core. You know, we brought Jeff Lyle and Dean Baraldi and um, trying to think of the all four of those guys. They all came in and were and they they changed they were able we were able to change the attitude with those guys. And then and then we we hadn't quite figured out the the uh, uh, the missionary program because that was something that that none of us were really familiar with. Okay. And so so I I remember I I my I was recruiting a, de- a defensive player out of Kearns or someplace and and so I'm in the home. We're talking about the mission, right? And I'm saying, well, you know who. Who pays for the mission and all that stuff? They said, well, we save for it and we pay for it. And I said, well, you know, where do you go? You know, just, and so then I, I figured out kind of how it worked. And then I, I remember going back and said, Hey, look, in order to succeed here, you're going to have to, you, you're, you, we're going to have to have a, a, a plan for, for, for missionaries because that's the only way it's going to work. And right now BYU has, the upper hand on all, all on all this stuff, and um, and so I, I can remember Wayne said, "Well, we can't. We got to win right away. We haven't got time to develop a missionary program." And I I always say, "Well, if you're going to succeed here, you're going to have you're you're, you're going to have to rely on these missionary kids, and you have to be patient with how to do it and understand." So it was there was there was just a um, you know, understanding the culture and how the state operated was really important. And then I got a great feel for, for you know, how you could su- succeed at at Utah just by being there as an assistant coach because I could see where the flaws were. And it was a basketball school, you know, and and um, and BYU ran the state, and Lavelle was like a god, you know. So you just had to. You know, okay, so we're gonna have to. If you're gonna succeed here, you're gonna have to overcome all these things, and you, and you have to have a system to do it. But you know, it, it just was a hard thing for that group because most of the coaches were the, the assistant coach came from California, and we had Steve Halsey was from Utah, and and he was on that staff, and def, guys from different parts of the country then in. Some of them didn't understand just how, you know, how this culture, how the culture worked here. And so, but I could see, okay, you know, in order for you to success here, the culture has to accept you as one of, one of theirs. You can't, you can't be considered an outsider. And, and, uh, and that had to be, you know, that had to be done. So I could, I could see all of those things, you know, that had to, had to be done. I think our third year we had a really good football team, and then Wayne resigned. I think in the fourth or fifth year, I can't remember. And uh, and that's when things changed. You know, then they hired Chuck Stobart, and, and he, he he was like putting a, a round peg in a square hole because he <laughs> he did he absolutely did not fit, and he didn't and he didn't understand how it worked. You know, I mean, it was, it was hard. You bring a guy from Michigan who worked for Bo Schumacher and you bring him into, into, into the Utah culture. I mean, he did, he just doesn't understand how the religion works, how everything works. And in order to be successful, you have to just understand, you know, how it goes. Mm-hmm. And, and so, uh, then that was, uh, so, so I left and went to Wisconsin and, um, and it was, um, and it, that was great, a, a great job working for Dave McClain was really, was really good. And, and coaching in that league was great because the fans were so rapid. You know, Wisconsin's a great place to, place to coach because the fan base is unreal. They're you terrific. Know? Yep. Yeah. They love, they drink and they, and they, 
and they and they enjoy their Saturdays. They enjoy they the fifth enjoy, quarter as much as they do the first four quarters because of the party well, aspect. <laughs> hey, they're 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 lubed up when they come in, and they're more lubed up when they leave. <laughs> so, so, but that that to me, Madison, that t- that town is is uh, is that's why they call it Mad Town because I tell you what, it is it it Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, that town is wired, you know, oh, yeah. because they, so they, they, uh, they enjoy, they enjoy themselves and, and, uh, and I, I, I really enjoyed my time there, but I, uh, the one thing I hated was it was so cold, it was miserable, you know, because the university sits between two lakes. And so in the winter, man, it's just unbearable. Yep, I've but, been there several times. You're right; they get after it, but the winters are 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 tough to persevere through. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was I, I was happy when I was able to come back to Utah, and um, and work for Jim Fassel for a couple of years, and then and then uh, I was I was in um, I think I was in San Jose recruiting and. Uh, Dave Fagg, who worked for uh, for Dick Tomey, called me and said, uh, "Dick Tomey wants to talk to you." And and uh, I said, "What's there anyone to talk to me about?" And she said, well, "He wants you to be his offensive line coach." And I said, "Well, I don't know Dick very well." He said, "Well, yeah, he he knows you from your film and from what people say." And and so I went. I went to, so I flew from San Jose to Arizona and I never even, I didn't, I didn't even take an interview, you know, and, and, uh, Dave Fagg just kind of, Dick told me he wants to hire you. Here's what he's going to pay you. And, uh, and, and so I called, I remember I called my wife and I said, well, they offered me a job in Arizona. And she said, you, you have to take it because you, Utah's not going anywhere. I said because you're not you're not recruiting tough enough players, and Passel is not going to succeed. And uh, and she says you have to go to Arizona. And so uh, and I wanted to I wanted to stay at Utah because I loved Utah. But and she was right. She was so right. I, yep. Yeah, she was totally right. And so I I uh, I took the Arizona job, which was which. And and he was a great man to work for. He was a smart guy, great recruiter, uh, great with the players. Um, you know, just just that, that couple of three years that I worked for him were really really good years because he 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 had built um, a really really Larry Smith had left, and then there was uh, and, and we had kind of rebuilt kind of what Larry had left there and. and uh, we ended up with some really, some really good players, and and um, were able to really do some good, some good things. And then when the uh, Utah job came open, um, you know, so that was a job I really that I really wanted. And the Wisconsin job came open at the same time, and so did UNLV come open at the same time. And so the people from Wisconsin had contacted me about coming back there. I talked to the people at UNLV and and uh, and I talked to people at Utah, but the only job I wanted was a Utah job because that's a job I always wanted. And and if I was ever going to be a head coach, that's where I wanted to be the head coach. And so I put all of all of my energy in, into the uh, into the Utah job and fortunately I was able to get the job. And it worked out quite well talking to Ron McBride, former Utah head coach. So let's talk about taking the Utah job. As you mentioned, you were at Arizona under Dick Tomey from 87 to 89. Who reached out to you about the Utah job and who really, you know, sort of played a a role in in getting you here in the end? Well, I think, you know, Bob Rice was, was one of the people. And I think if I remember right, it might've been Jerry Green who, who worked for Bob at Contacted me and and um, and then obviously I knew Chris Hill from from when so Chris was here as a um, 
he he was, he was a graduate assistant for Jerry for Jerry Penn when when um, you know when when I was an assistant coach for Wayne Howard. Right, he had come so, with Bill Foster, but worked for Penn for a long time. You're right. Yes, yeah. yeah. So 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 he was working for Penn. So I got to know Chris because they he he was always they they were in the same building we were in, and so I would see him probably every day. You know. Yeah. He just, and they were, he was doing a lot of grunt work at that time. And, and so I would see him, see him and, and, uh, we would talk and, and I got to know him pretty well at that time. And then, uh, Chase Peterson was the president at, of the university and, and, uh, I, I knew him and I, and I knew, uh, RJ Snow. So he was really, and, and, and at that time he was, he was a second to the president, R.J. Snow, who went up down at BYU, who his his daughter Lolly was was my youngest daughter's best friend. Okay. So so I had you know I had some in in I and I think that that at that time Utah was looking for a little more of a uh, blue collar type football coach mm-hmm. because they they'd hired kind of. You know, guys who, you know, Jim Fossils and the, and the, you know, Chuck Stobarts and, you know, guys who kind of, kind of flashy, you know, and, um, and at that time, but what they, well, I think they were looking for a different type of person, you know, more of a, more of a kind of, a, a, a blue collar type, type person. And, and, um, and I kind of, I think I kind of fit maybe what they were looking for at that at that point, and so I just put all my marbles into that. And Dick Tomey was a great help, you know, because he he um, he was he was pushing the dial from behind the scenes, and um, and we had a good, and I had a good plan going in, you know, as to what uh, I knew exactly what it what needed to be done here. I mean. It, I mean, I knew from A to Z what it had to be done and how it needed to be done because I, I played it over my mind for ever since I left Utah to go other places. And, uh, so it just, uh, you know, it just, it just, it just, and then be able to put the plan into order and then, and then make it work and, uh, and, and try to keep, you know, keep consistency in what you're doing, and and um, and work through the problems to get to get to the get to other things. Yeah, you know, Ronnie Chris Hills told me the story of watching the BYU game in 1989 uh, at the end of Fossil's tenure, and Utah lost that game 70 to 31. And right. you mentioned the need to, uh, for someone like you, who was more blue collar, who was going to emphasize defense and and ball control with the football, and and he certainly recognized what we're doing isn't working. You know, we we can't we can't do this, and and you seem to be the right guy that uh, was fitting what he needed. But a couple other things you talked about, you know, Wayne Howard, uh, whom you coached under at Utah, had a plan. Uh, he was a guy who had built programs other places, but you talked about. Understanding the missionary program, understanding the Utah culture. Obviously, it didn't work for Wayne long term, or it did for you. So, those are two things you, you touched on. But also, you talked about the the idea of having a plan and the financial support. You talked about Bob Rice uh, playing a part in you getting the job. And for people who don't know, the Rice on Rice Eccles Stadium is from Bob Rice from the donation he made back in the seventies right. to to renovate the stadium uh, before the the overhaul in ninety eight. So. You're running to sell people on your plan. Obviously, it takes money, but you got to get people to say, you know what, I'm going to put my money behind this. You know, when you were talking to people about, hey, we're going to do it this way, we need a facility, we need a weight room, we need all these things. You know, how did you get the financial support behind you and, and to get those people on board to do the things well, you wanted the, to do? Yeah, well, the right, the echoes were huge. Right. Rich, Richie Smith at that time, the Smith Boot King people were huge. You know, they, they, they invested heavily in the program, you know, um, so there was three or four families that just, uh, made a huge difference from, from building because, you know, they, with, when the stadium thing came up, you know, around, and it was around the Olympics, you know, Mm -hmm. the, so, so that had to, 
So they were talking about just doctoring up the stadium so it looked good for the Olympics, right? Just kind of uh, uh, putting a face, kind of putting a, a a facelift on it. Yep. And so there was a guy named Lon who was who was uh, who was Eccles' attorney, right? And he was kind of the guy who handled all their part of their finances. And so I would see him all the time because he. He swam laps over at Steiner, and I swam laps over there, so I would okay. see. Okay. And then when I say, "Hey, dude, man, you got to, we got to build this stadium. We got one chance to do this." Yep. And and so he was in all their meetings, and he'd say, "Well, you know, they're talking about just, you know, one guy wants to just put this this doctorate up, and another guy wants to do this, and and um, and uh, I said, no, I said, no, dude, hey, the only way." He's, you get this done is you got to, we got to build a new stadium. You got one chance to do this. And, 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 it, and this is, and this is the time. And then, um, then I think Eccles committed the first 10 million, mm-hmm. if I remember right. Yep. And, and, um, uh, other people, other people, you know, fell into line, you know, and, um, uh, the family that, that built the, the academic center, Burbage family, um, the Burbage family. I I remember I had lunch with. I think Ken Burbage was getting a a, a surgery. Uh, I think he was getting a transplant of some type, and I visited him in the hospital. And he says, "Coach, we're going to build the stadium." He said, "I guarantee you." And um, and so so yeah, so Burbage was the Burbage family, the, the Eccles family. The Rice family, the Clark, you know, Spence Clark, mm-hmm. you know, all these people were huge back in back in the day of of financially allowing, you know, football to to go forward because they were willing to invest in in the, and then uh, we had a gentleman. gentleman Oh, you know what? He's doing a radio show. Yeah. And so, 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 anyways, uh, uh, you know, so this this guy built our 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 indoor our, our you know that that first indoor facility we had, and so he, he was another guy. But all these people stepped up and gave us the little things that we needed to succeed. Yeah, it was a pivotal time. As you mentioned, the Olympics were awarded to Salt Lake coming in 2002. And I remember in 96, 97, there was talk about what do we do with the stadium. And at the time, people might remember who were there. It was timbers. I mean, it wasn't poor concrete. It was this old stadium that needed a ton of upkeep. And the press box was one single level. And and right. uh, a, a large family would fill that thing by themselves, let alone bringing the entire world in for the Olympics. So there was certainly a need, and and yes, it was talked about. Hey, let's just let's, let's dress it up, and 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 people like yourself said, no, let's let's do this right. We've got a chance here to really do something special. A huge undertaking to build that stadium back in in uh, you know ninety six, ninety seven, and it opened in ninety nine, and and uh, it's just a fantastic venue that uh, is being renovated right now with the South End Zone structure, but. Um, you got some people excited, Ronnie. I think it's kind of what it came down to is you came in here with a plan and an idea uh, and you were committed to being here long term. And so people got behind it and it all came together. Let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, what happened on the field. You know, you mentioned that your plan was to come in and, and by year three or four to, to have things where you wanted it. And a key thing happened in, in 1993. You know, you talked about the BYU program and how they were established under Lavelle and Lavelle was king. And you know how it is. If you want to be the best, you got to beat the best at some point. You can talk about it. You can get close. But at some point, you got to get it done. And then your team, in uh, 1993, you beat BYU in Provo. It was just the third win for the Utes over the Cougars in 22 years. It was on the road. And, uh, you know, just talk about in terms of building your program and and just sort of uh, solidifying what you were doing and, and giving us some some. Uh, some some credentials. Talk about what that win in '93 over BYU did for you in building the Utah program. Well, you know that was really the the probably the biggest win in the history of the program because yep. uh, I could tell when. First of all, one thing I learned from from Dick is is uh, 
you never worry about the team you have to that you have to beat. In other words, everybody is everybody. All they talk about it around here was beating BYU, mm-hmm. and so I would tell people, "Says we played BYU the last game of the season, we'll worry about that the week before. We got we got another ten games to play before that, and we'll worry about each game. But but BYU at, at this point is no big deal to me. And so what what I and we learned that it, it, in Arizona, like we never worried about Arizona State until the week before we played them. And, and they were, they were our big, you know, everybody hated Arizona State. And, but, and they keep trying to make a big deal out of it. And Tommy would say, Hey, we'll worry about them the week before we play them. That's it. But we got to worry about beating SC. We got to worry about UCLA. We got to worry about all these other schools. And so I said, we, we're not going to worry about BYU. We're just going to, you know, take our time. And we could tell that the team, when we beat them at their stadium, that was really the turning point because we knew then we knew we were better than they were or equal. You know, mm-hmm. another, we didn't have to do anything special to beat them. We just had to play good football. You know, it wasn't like you had to pull something out of your hat to win. You just go out there and play a good physical brand of football and you're going to be in the game and you're going to have an opportunity to win in the fourth quarter. And then yours is kick, you know, is, is was, you know, 55 yard field goal to win it or whatever. And, and uh, it changed the whole complexion of, of Utah football. Mm-hmm. You know, you, and you that make, was, go ahead. Yeah, so you make some great points there about you, you did take it one game at a time and you never got too far ahead. But at the same time, you didn't downplay the game. You realized it was important to this fan base, it was important to your program to beat them. And it seemed like you always had your team ready to play against BYU. Even years before the win, you, you played them very well. You had some great games. You could tell the gap was closing, but you certainly didn't underplay the importance of that game when that week came around. No, absolutely not. And you know what? Players know. You don't have to tell them. Right. They know. They know. They understand the importance of the game. And you don't have to tell them. That, you know, whenever you're playing your, your art driver, whether it's high school or junior college or small four-year program or whatever if you're playing the, the the team that's your rival the players completely understand what has to be done because they they're excited to play the game you know because they know especially if you've got enough in-state players on your football team you know so the more like at arizona the more arizona kids you had that understood the importance of beating arizona state the more utah kids you had on your football team that understood the importance of being byu uh, you know, the, the, the fact that the, the, the tradition you have to do to, to play these people. So, and I could tell when we got on that, I can remember that bus ride from, from uh, Salt Lake to Provo that day, just like it was yesterday, because, uh, when we got on the bus, it was extremely quiet. You know, there wasn't a sound. And I can remember going down to Provo and, and the bus driver going over a curb because something was blocked. And he said, Hey, I got to wait for these people. I said, no, no, man, dude, dude, drive over the curb. Who cares? <laughs> you know? and, and, and I can remember him driving over the curb, taking a shortcut and honking his horn, get people out of the way. And I can remember the players didn't walk off the bus. They ran off the bus, you know, and it was not a matter of, 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 you know, they, I mean, they were ready when they, when they, when they got on the bus in Salt Lake and when they got off the bus in Pro, they were ready. You know, mm-hmm. you could tell us that they were ready and you could feel that, that, that something special was going to happen that day. Yeah, and it sure uh, did. And it did. Yeah. And, and the, uh, and from then on, then, the, then the series became, you know, every game become were really tight. And it depends who made some plays in the fourth quarter as to who won the, who won the game. And that's kind of when the culture, when the culture changed and, uh, and BYU didn't become, wasn't, wasn't any more thought of being, you know, the kings of the state of Utah, you know, because there, there was another group had arrived. 
They sure did. So again, before 1993, or including 1993, just the third win over the Cougars in 22 years, and and that really turned things around. You won six of your last ten against BYU. So you talked about sort of you guys catching up to them and and uh, you know sharing the throne with them in this state and in, and in the conference. But you know it's just so interesting. You know sometimes rivals uh, have a hard time being friendly or, or really getting along at all. But yet you and Lavelle Edwards had this special thing. You did the commercials for uh, the bank in town, 34, right. 31, that went over so huge. And and you guys, you know, every chance you could get at the big five luncheons and golf tournaments and, you know, things you would do. You guys, you know, were, were so great together. And I, I think it was just fun for the state to see you two interact the way you did, the respect you showed each other, the way you, you went about things. Just talk a little bit about your relationship with Lavelle. I mean, unfortunately we lost him a few years back, but uh, a big man in the state and you, and you guys just, I thought were, were so great together for so many years. Well, Lavelle was really a good friend. And, um, and I tell you what, he was, uh, he was a joy to be around. And, you know, I don't like to like, you don't, you know, it's not good to like your arch rival, you know, but he was a guy you could never dislike. You know yeah. what I mean? Because he was just, he was just he, he never turned down a chance to to uh, help an organization you know make an appearance um, you know we did a lot of things together you know and he was always gracious and um, you know just just uh, you know he was just he was just a special a special human being you know and then we did that radio show for five years after after I, I I retired and, 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 uh, he retired. And so we would, we had those and my, my wife and his wife do still do a lot of stuff together. They go to lunch and they, they go to, go to plays and they do different things together. And, and so we were, we, we were, uh, we were very good friends. And, um, and he was, he was a marvelous human being, you know, I just, uh, I'd always say, well, People would always say that the prophet is the most important person in the in the LDS Church, and I would always say, well, maybe maybe the prophet's the most important, but to Brigham Young University, the most important person is Lavelle Edwards, and uh, so and, and people would always, when you see people across the country, they they all knew they all knew Lavelle, knew who he was, knew about him, you know, so it was. Um, but he was a special. He was a special man. There only there's only gonna be one guy like him, you know, and that's that's they, they don't make another one. Very well said. Uh, yes, a wonderful man, and and you're right. What he did with the football program, Lavelle, was as, as important to BYU as anyone who's ever worked on that campus, and 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 did some tremendous things. And like I said, it was just so fun to watch the two of you and your interaction at various things and, and the friendship you formed in the midst of a rivalry. It was such a, a cool time to be a sports fan in this state when, when you guys were going at it. You know, Coach, let's, let's look back kind of at uh, the, the highlights of your Utah career. We kind of talked about the building process and, and uh, what lured you here and what your plan was. But let's talk about kind of that, that 94 season. Uh, we mentioned the win over BYU in 93. You had your team in a couple bowl games at that point, but that 94 season, the first 10-win season in school history, you guys beat Arizona in the Freedom Bowl to finish eighth in the coaches' poll, 10th in the AP poll. I remember, you know, I lived in the Midwest at the time, and I remember hearing about Utah football, and I watched the game against Colorado State and Fort Collins that was on ABC with Musburger and, and Dick Vermeil, and it seemed like that was the season that really put Utah football on the map. Just talk about how that team for 94 came together and, and some of the highlights of that season as you look back at it? Well, first of all, the, the team should have been undefeated. You know, we shouldn't have lost a game. You know, we lost to a, not a very good New Mexico team, I think, at New Mexico, which was which was a huge loss. Um, lost to them by two in early November, yep. Right, right. And the game we should have, we, it was our own fault we lost the game. It wasn't nothing to do with New Mexico. You know, it was just, we made some, we made some major coaching errors in that game and that's very costly. And uh, I think we, maybe we lost the Air Force. You did the next yeah. week, back-to-back losses. Back to, yeah, yep. back-to-back losses. 
And I remember the Air Force game was another one where, where, you know, we made a couple of mistakes that cost us the game. And then we came back and beat BYU at the, at uh, the last game of the year. And then Arizona was the number one ranked team in the country at the start of the year. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had, you know, they had a great defense, you know, they, with the, uh, with you know, the desert storm defense so the guys could really play they could really run. And, um, and we played a, a, you know, it was a gutsy, gutsy knockdown drag out game. I think we had 75 yards in offense and I think they had 125 or 130, maybe a little more. It was a defensive struggle the whole day. And, and McCoy to Dyson was a huge thing. And, and, and Cal Beck's return of, of a punt. Yep. Another one. And, and, um, and so it, I know Tommy never lived that game down. I mean, he still would, every time we, we coach a lot of all star games, uh, and after, uh, after I've retired and he'd always talk about that game. He was still upset about that game. And, uh, I said, well, you know, hey, just one of those days, bro. (laughs) 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 He would say, well, we dropped the ball, and the tight end dropped the touchdown in the end zone. Yeah, I said, well, your tight end couldn't catch. And uh, and, and they were built entirely on defense and were very conservative offensively. And and, uh, and so we (laughs) – we just, uh, I guess, outlasted them on that day, and that was, that was a, that was a huge win. The Colorado State game was really a, a great football game because Colorado State was really good. Yep. And that day we when we played lights out down there, and, and I think you know, the Lust kid intercepted a, a pass down in the far end zone and returned it, and uh, and so it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was just. Uh, you know, there were some great, really great games. I think we beat Oregon up there. Uh, and they won the Pac-12 that year, Oregon did. Yeah, yeah they, and they were really good. They were really good. And I tell you what, Rich Brooks, who I worked for at at, uh, at Kentucky, so Rich was still upset about that game, you know. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so he, 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 would, he would bring that up on occasions, you know, yeah. when I worked with him, you know. I said, well, you know, because we we ran a fake field goal, I think, in in and uh, uh, to, for six points. I remember in that game, and and I said, well, you, what, what was it? I asked him, well, what's your field goal team doing? We, you know, we knew where there was a hole in your your gap, and we were going to run that fake, and it's there because you guys didn't protect it, you know, and. Uh, but so that but that was because because Oregon was loaded. And Oregon is tough to beat up there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, because first of all, when you play a pack a Pac-10 school at that time, the officials were not going to help you. Let's let's be honest. Right, you're you're going you're, you're not going to get a break from the officials <laughs> because first of all, everybody's looking to protect their. Uh, you know, protect their league as much as they can because they can't afford to have um, a team from the Mountain West come in and beat a Pac-12 team. They just it can't. You know, it's 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 just not it's not it's not good. Well, it's not a home good. game they scheduled to, to be a win, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's the thinking is okay. It's a non-conference game. It's a win to help us do big things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you so you gotta you know you you know when you go out there you're not going to get any calls in your favor. And uh, so you, you just have to not worry about it and play through it. And you're going to get some, you're going to get some questionable calls that are, aren't going to help you, and they're they're probably going to get some questionable calls that are probably going to help them. So you just you just figure that out going up there, and don't worry about it because it's going to happen. And uh, but that was that, but the Oregon win was really huge. Colorado State game was huge. You know, losing those two games back to back were were really disappointing. But coming back and beating BYU and then and then uh, winning the bowl game, uh, and then being I think ranked eighth in the country or whatever it was 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 huge for the program. 
Yep, eighth in the coaches' poll, tenth by AP to wrap things up. You know, Ronnie, I remember sitting in Kyle Weddingham's office in the spring of 2007, and he said, you know, in 08, we could be really, really good. He could see this thing was coming, and the personnel was lined up, and he knew what he had. And, and usually that's the case, especially in football. It's so hard to build a team. You can't do it overnight like you can maybe in a sport like basketball where you get a transfer or a JUCO kid and, and they change your, your team around. But in football, you've got to build it. So, you know, going into that 94 season with guys like Luther Ellis, who was an All-American, consensus All-American, in fact. You had Anthony Brown on the line. You had Mike McCoy, quarterback. You had the personnel lined up. You mentioned Harold Lust, that big play against CSU. Did you, did you know that 94 team was going to be that good? Going into yeah, that season. Well, yeah, yeah, Ray. I knew it was first of all, I when we broke for the first for our, for uh, for summer, right? I remember I remember we I had a meeting and talked about okay, the, the importance of you guys taking care of your business, make sure when you're when you're on campus I don't wanna have to go looking for you to make sure you're getting your workouts done and all that kind of stuff. And and I remember Mike McCoy stepping up and said Coach, we will take care of this team. And Luther saying the same thing. You got any problems? We'll take care of it. And so they were, they took care of any, sure, we had problems that summer, but they took care of every situation that came up. Mm. And never, and never got to my office ever. And I said, if there's some problem, they said, we got it. Don't worry about it. And so they, they kind of policed themselves, you know. And I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to continually go looking for somebody or, or, or group because all I do is say, Hey, I haven't seen this guy and, and Luther or Mike or, or, or one of the DBs or one of the guys say, Oh, I, I got, I got a coach. I know where he's at, you know? Yeah. And so, so they took care, they took care of, uh, and right then I could tell we got good leadership. And, and Luther was, Luther might have been the most important player in turning the program around because his locker room presence, how he worked in the weight room, how he went about his business in the classroom, you know, uh, just, just his, and he was a, he was a huge talker. He never said much in the locker room, but when he talked, everybody listened, you know, and he was one of those guys, you know what I mean? He had so much, everybody respected him. And and uh, understood w- what what he stood for, and he was he was really a, 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 a really a huge a huge difference in, in in the locker room, the weight room, and and all aspects of what we're trying to get done. Yeah, he was certainly huge for you. I want to talk to you more about Mike McCoy. I first met Mike when he was tending bar at Lumpy's after he right. was done playing, and, and and then to see him years later. You know, as a coordinator in the NFL and a head coach in the NFL, obviously a guy who really understood the game. And when he played for you those years, could you kind of see that potential in him in terms of the cerebral aspects? First of all, he he didn't have a great arm, you know, and uh, but he was a complete winner, mm-hmm. very very intelligent guy, you know, and 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 he knew what to do with the football, when to do it. He knew he had a good feel for reading coverage, reading where the ball should go, you know, being able to rise to the right, to the right play, look at the right, look at the right thing. I remember I got a call from, uh, so that, so a quarterback got hurt in Canada. So they called me and said, well, where's McCoy? I said, well, he's over there. You could probably, so they, they, they brought him in on a, a Sunday, and I think the following Sunday he started for for that particular team in Canada. I remember the coach called back and said, "I said this guy knew our whole offense within three days." Wow, you know, and uh, but Mike was just he's just one of those guys, you know, a great leader. Not he didn't talk a whole lot, but he was so productive. Because he always got you in the right situation, he always made the right play at the right time, and was very steady. He never panicked. You know, he just he just was very even keel, 
about how he went about things, but he was a really good leader. Sure was, and uh, won a lot of gain for you back in the day. Uh, you know, Coach, you and I had a chance to do uh, kind of a, a special session with Steve Smith uh, a couple of years ago, a corporate event right. that Pepsi put on, and and we kind of surprised Stevie and brought you in last minute, and and uh, you told some great stories about Steve Smith that night. In terms of personalities in Utah football history, he's got to be one of the biggest. I mean, he was a kid who came in and uh, was competitive to the max and uh, a big-time talent, and and was one of those guys in your latter years who was, was so big for you. Just, you know, tell us a few stories about Steve, about what attracted you to him and, and how you sort of managed this guy who was very talented, but very raw and very uh, competitive when he came into the program and, and you helped mold him into what he's become. Just talk about Steve a little bit for us. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can remember when we, when we recruited him, you know, they, they had the other receiver at Santa Monica Junior College that everybody was recruiting that played in the NFL for a long time. Or I can't remember his name now, but he's on TV all the time. And so we go down there, Fred Graves and myself, and the the head coach at, at the Santa Monica Junior College says, yeah, well, I have, you're, you're, you're obviously here for this guy, but, you know, we also have this other guy and I said, well, tell me about your other guy. And he said, well, he's, you know, I got an edge to him. He's a little hard to handle. He's, uh, he's pretty hyper, very tough, tough kid. And I told Fred, I said, we don't want the big guy. We want this other guy because mm-hmm. he fits, he fits, he fits the kind of kids I like to recruit. And so when we, when we talked to him, I remember he had a real edge about him. And I can remember he says, well, aren't you here for so I said, no, dude, we're here for you. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and so, um, so yeah, so he had, you know, he had a tough upbringing. You know, he was raised by his mom, basically. And, and he, 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 he worked part time, I think at McDonald's after practice. And then he, and his mom lived in, in, uh, in Compton, and he would have to drive his bike from from Santa Monica back to the Compton to get home. And you know, he had a hard he had a hard life. Sure did. And and, uh, and I, I said, well, that's the kid we want, you know. And I can remember when he came to visit up here, and uh, you know, I could tell you could tell by you know he he'd never been out of L.A. And so you say, well, you know, how's he going to fit in this uh, in Utah? You know, because it's a whole different culture. Mm-hmm. And I said, but this is the guy we want, and then we'll, we'll, you know. And Fred was really good. I mean, Fred was really good with players, and he was hard on the players, and he didn't put up with much, you know. So you always, Fred was a real disciplinarian type coach, and and and. And particularly good with the Afro kids, you know. I mean, he could keep them in line pretty much. And we, so we, when we knew when we recruited Steve and we got him to come here, that yeah, it wasn't going to be easy, you know. So, so we had, you know, we had his trials and tribulations with him off the field to begin with. Uh, and and uh, but Fred, Fred kept kept on him and kept kept him in check. Uh, but a kid, I'll tell you what, kid loved to play football and he loved to compete. You know, he was a nasty competitor. And the, the bigger the challenge, uh, the bigger he, and he wanted, he wanted the ball all the time. And he, you know, hey, get me the ball. I'll make it, I'll make it happen. You know, and, and he was just one of those guys that, that he had, he had the mentality. And he had a chip on his shoulder, and he, you know, he's just one of those guys that 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 he he knew how to practice, and especially he loved it going against the Dyson boys in practice. Mm-hmm. They would they would they would they would, they would get in fights every day between between uh, Andre and and Andre's brother Patrick, you know, because both of them were DBs. I mean, they yep. got, those guys would be going at it. And and Steve would always be, you know, Fred Whittingham would be getting on him, and he'd be he'd be right he'd mouth him right back to him, you know. <laughs> and and, uh, and so he, 
So every day was a every day was a challenge in practice as to and Steve was going to prove every day that he was the better he was a better player than than the DBs. You know that was so he liked the competition and uh, and I tell you what I can remember he broke his neck in the BYU game um, in his junior year. And he played, so he came out. He said, oh, "I got a sore neck, you know." And, and the trainer checked that and said, "Yeah." And he said, "But I'm okay." And so he completed the game. And I can remember going up to the up to the university hospital, and they said, "Well, he has a, you know, he has a broken broken neck." And and I can remember the guy saying, "I I don't think I don't think this kid should play football again." And um, and he had big tears in his eyes, you know, and he said, hey, nothing's going to stop me from playing football. So we let, he healed up, and he was able to come back and have a great senior year. And never really had a problem with his neck again that I know of, you know. But yeah. he, was, he was just a, he was one of those guys, you know. And when he met his wife going into his senior year, that really changed his life a lot because now he was spending a lot of time with her Mm -hmm. and therefore he wasn't out, you know, out at night any place and, and he got better academically and he kind of, he kind of settled into a different, a different way of doing things. And and he became, uh, you know, a, you know, it became much easier to manage because he was much happier because this girl that that he married or still married to is was just fantastic for him. You know, she was she had a real calming effect on him and uh, and she was to me, she was just a real blessing in his life. Yeah, you're right. I've talked to Steve and he mentioned how much uh, his wife Angie has done for him going back to their college days. And yeah, you know, one of my favorite pictures, Ronnie, is is from that nineteen ninety nine season. You you beat BYU by three in Provo and then you play Fresno State in the Vegas Bowl. And there's a picture of you on the podium with Steve Smith in a neck brace and Jay Hill uh flanked to another side as you guys beat Fresno State in that Vegas bowl and and uh, you hear the story about how, you know, Steve Smith played the BYU game with a broken neck and, and didn't want to come out. And you're just like, my goodness, to, for this guy to go from, you know, playing to being in a neck brace to being told maybe you should, should quit just talks about, you know, his toughness and mental approach. And, and uh, obviously he went on and had a, a great 15-year-plus career in the NFL. Um, what, a, what a special person. Uh, you know, in addition to receivers and, and some defensive guys we talked about, Ronnie, you always seem to have a running back. You always seem to have that guy from Jamal Anderson to Chris Fumatu Maafala, Mike Anderson in the latter years. Can you pick out a guy who was your best running back and why? Well, I'll tell you what. So of all the places that we, from, from Gavilan Junior College all the way to UC Riverside to Long Beach State to we had we had great tailbacks. All of them drafted guys, all played in the NFL, every one of them. And so we we had really you know we had really struck it rich over the years. And, and I could pick I could pick tailbacks out off a of film. If you had to watch a tailback for more than uh, ten minutes on film, then you don't want to recruit them. Okay, huh, so okay. you 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 could tell like like. Like Michael Anderson, you know, you only had to watch five minutes of film on him, and he said, "Okay, how do we get, get him?" Yep. Or and, and I watch. I remember watching a Puma Tuma follows film because his older brother was playing for us, right? And so I'm over there visiting the family, and and uh, and Roy Mafa says, "Hey, you got to come up and watch this film on my brother." And so I'm up. I, I'm up at there at the mom's house and I'm watching this this film on on uh, Chris I said oh my god this guy's for real you know <laughs> and, and everybody's recruiting him as a fullback and I said no no he's a tailback and Chris Chris said I don't like to block I want to run the ball I said, you know, <laughs> you, I said you ain't blocking for us dude you're running <laughs> and, and 
And uh, the same thing with Jamal Anderson was the same thing, you know. Uh, a lot of people were, were quoting him as a fullback, tailback combination. And I said, and I watched, I watched maybe seven or eight minutes of film on him. I said, no, this kid's a tailback. And, and, uh, and you could tell, you know, you, you, you could just, the, the really great tailbacks, I mean, they just have a vision and they have a way of doing things. You just don't have to watch a lot of film on them to know what they're, what they're capable of doing, especially, in your offense, and uh, so the the best ones, it's hard to it's hard to say because all those guys were really good, and and so it was, you know, Michael was special, Jamal was special, uh, Juan Johnson was special, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so all those all those guys. And that's what, you know, the, the, uh, the one thing that I guess hurt my career, I guess, would, would be that the fact that, so we're that the year I got fired. So I, ha- I had a backup tailback that was, was really, that was really good. And I had a starting tailback that was really good. And then we lost our starter at, in the, uh, you know, I think it was the Kansas game, and he was leading the country in rushing. I think when we lost him, and then, and then uh, the guy who was going to be the backup, he, uh, they declared they wouldn't let him stay in, wouldn't let him stay in school, and uh, it, it didn't know that until, uh, till the middle of the summer, and he'd already been there. In the, for for you know for about six seven months and it just was was really a really tough kid because he was a big tailback and then that the third guy the third guy we had was a smaller a smaller guy who wasn't really tough and so then what happens is your 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 quarterback has to be more than a game manager he has to be a creator mm-hmm. and that's when we changed changed quarterbacks and then and then we uh we're playing you know we played played with uh with the kid that ended up starting for for uh you know for my replacement the first game that he got hurt and then the rest was alex's alex's deal and we knew, we knew at the time alex was going to be a great player and um uh, but it's not just you know just one of those one of those things that happened but to to say who's the best one, that's pretty hard to to you know. Chris could be as when he was healthy, he he was as good as anybody ever played the game, you know. And and uh, Michael played no matter what, you know. He played with injuries. He played through things, and and and, and Jamal was the same way. Jamal would play no matter what, you know. I mean, he was. He was, you know, and he wanted he wanted the ball, and uh, so I don't know. All those guys were were really were really good. Derek Williams, a kid we had at UC Riverside, he was a great great tailback and mm-hmm. great vision, great quickness. Uh, kid named Vernon Long, we had at at Gavilan Junior College, kid out of came to us from Baltimore or something. He was. Big, strong, tough kid. You know, could really could rock and roll with the best of them. And and the uh, the Herb Herb Lusk, when when uh, we were at Long Beach State, he led the country in rushing, and he was he was a a power runner. You know, and he's a guy too. He just he never wanted to come out. You know, just keep feeding him the ball. I mean, he he probably carried the ball twenty twenty one twenty two times a game. Yeah. So, so you know they they all had they all had their own special thing about them and uh, and we had good offensive lines we had real physical offensive lines and, and guys that could you know could could block the power all well and and, uh, and and guys who understand how to be physical. Yep. You know, as I asked the question, coach, I realized there might there might not be an answer, and that's kind of why I asked it because you had so many who were so good and. As you said, your, your your blueprint was ball control and run the football. You always had really good offensive lines, and 
and for a running back looking to come in and make a splash and, and, and make a name for themselves, you certainly had a program that was set up to do that. And uh, you had a lot of great ones come through. Uh, speaking of, of great people coming through the program, Kyle Whittingham joined your staff in 1994 as an assistant coach. His father, Fred, was your defensive coordinator. Right. Uh, Fred moved on, had a chance to coach at the next level in the, NFL, in the NFL. And within one year, you went to Kyle Whittingham and said, you're my defensive coordinator. Obviously, you saw some things in him at a very young age that, that made you think this guy is capable of being a coordinator, and now he's a head coach who's done some wonderful things with the Utah program. Just tell us what you saw in, in Kyle back in the day that maybe – gave you an indication of what he would be capable of doing during his coaching career. Yeah, well, Kyle was a pretty methodical uh, kind of coach, you know, just an every kind of an every, what you call everyday guy and just, you know, goes about his business. And I can remember he was up at Idaho State and uh, Wayne Howard gave me a call and he was at Long Beach City College at that time. And he said, hey, there's a there's a there's a kid in here recruiting from Idaho State that is looking for a change and he's and he does a good job here of uh, Kyle Whittingham and I said yeah I know I know who he is I you know his dad works for me and then and then Tim Davis who was an assistant coach at at uh, at Idaho State had worked with Kyle and I asked. Uh, Tim about Kyle, he 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 really recommended him highly, and then Russ Bollinger, who was a scout at that time for uh, Detroit, I think, and had played for me at Long Beach, and he, he knew Kyle from from uh, when he played at at uh, BYU, and uh, and of course Fred, you know, Fred really endorsed the kid, but I didn't I didn't go off what his dad's opinion was. I wanted to go off of what other people's opinion were and that worked with him and stuff. And, and, and so that I, and he knew, he knew the BYU program and he knew, you know, how to, how to, you know, how to defense the things that they do. And he brought a, you know, he brought an additional help to what we were doing. And so he was, and plus he understood Utah, you know, Mm -hmm. he understood, he understood the politics of Utah he understood the religious factors of Utah, and uh, and he was a good member of the church, you know, which was which was all all really important because that's what, kind of what we needed, you know, and and uh, so he was a real logical, very logical hire, you know, and and uh, seemed to and fit just exactly what we needed. Well, he's done some wonderful things. Uh, as I said at the top of our interview here, you were the guy who laid the foundation for what's happened in the years since. He coached the youth for 13 years from 1990 to 2002. Urban Meyer came in with a lot of the players you recruited. Uh, Alex Smith, first and foremost, among that group. And you had the undefeated season for the Utes. And in 2004, Cal Whittingham took over and he had the undefeated run in 08 and has taken the program in to the Pac 12. But as I said, really, it started 30 years ago with you. And coaches, we sort of wrap up here. As you look back at your tenure as the Utah head coach, what are you most proud of? What were maybe your greatest moments well, during your time? I, I, well, I'm, I'm most proud of what we accomplished, you know, and and the fact that we 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 built a base of how you play Utah football. You know, this is this is the structure, and this is what expected if you play here, and we built a foundation. For, for for what's what's carried on and that was the the whole thing that i wanted to do i wanted to build something that would last and the team when i got fired the team i left here was really good mm-hmm. and was all, and it was all young you know it was loaded and we redshirted some key players besides and so it was you know whoever got the job was gonna gonna inherit a really good football team and uh and so it, it was, it, so it, it carried, the nice thing about it, it carried itself and they hired a really good, obviously a really good coach in Urban Meyer. And, uh, and then it, it, you know, he was able to propel it, I guess, to the next level. And then, and then when Kyle, when, when Kyle got the job, he was able to take it to the, to the next step. And then 
getting getting into the Pac-10 was the biggest thing that probably ever happened to Utah football. No question. Yep. No because question. It, it changes. It changes kind of your your. You can upgrade your recruiting. You, you upgrade your facilities. You get better. You get better players. And the nice thing to see is a lot of the guys that are on Kyle's staff played for me. And then you see where Gary Anderson has gone. You see where Jay Hill has done, and and uh, all guys who, who have played at Utah that have had a lot of success in the coaching in the coaching business. And so the biggest pleasure I get is what is what happens to these kids after they get out of college and what they've accomplished. So that's that's. That's the biggest dividend that that um, that I see. Well, you brought a lot of kids in and you gave them a chance, uh, a chance for an education and a scholarship. And, and some guys moved on and played pro ball. Some uh, have moved on into the workforce and are productive members of society because of the chance you gave them. And in terms of the program, you know, you talk, Ronnie, about the evolution of Utah athletics. I think what Rick Majerus did in basketball with the Sweet 16 teams and the Final Four in 98 and – and uh, the foundation you laid for football allowed the 04 and the 08 seasons to happen that, you know, when the Pac-10 was ex- ready to expand uh, about 10 years ago, Utah was attracted because of what had been done uh, since about the, you know, the early 90s. And you were a big part of that and uh, just a great run. Coach, we appreciate your time dropping by. And, and uh, you are still a very busy man for someone who is, uh, quote unquote, retired. I know you're working with some some high schools in the metro area and you also have your Ron McBride Foundation. You just had your Love You Man golf tournament. Uh, as we record this on uh, August 5th, you had a couple of days ago on the 3rd. But a thing you're doing now that I, I heard about recently is you are making masks amidst the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. You're, you're making masks for Utah, BYU, Utah State, and Jazz fans. $20, a donation. Uh, it goes to your foundation and is, is supporting everything you do. Coach, just tell us about that that uh, initiative you've got going this summer. You know, I, I, first of all, how I got into it was that, you know, civilizations basically in the three categories, you know, you call it a red zone, a yellow zone, and a green zone. And 10% of your population is in the red zone. And so what you do is the idea of education is to take the people that are in the red zone and get them into the yellow zone and the green zone. And so that's kind of how we operated our football programs. Cause we always knew the guys that we, that the Steve Smiths of the world or this guy of the world that, you know, we're going to have problems, but the idea is to get them to the next phase so then they can handle their own stuff. And so what, what I wanted to do when I got done coaching is I, I want to reach out to all these kids that don't see where they have a real chance to succeed mm-hmm. and put them in a situation where they can see they can succeed. And the way you do it is you is through education because the more education you get, your thinking process changes. Because the more you're around educated people, the more your thinking changes as to what's right and what's wrong and how you can go forward in life. And so I want to reach kids when they're in grammar school, when they're in junior high school. And and we support a lot of what we call after school programs. And I think this is where kids have a different uh a, a different level of 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 respect for teachers because the teachers we pay for the teachers to work with these kids after school and they the the, the kids get to know these teachers as different people where they can now the teacher can actually have more influence on them because they get to know the teacher as a person and then they can have somebody to confide in somebody to give them some direction and somebody to answer questions that they have. And so if you've got people that have an influence on young people in an indirect way, not by just tell them, do this, do this, do this, you know, but they listen and then they say, well, you know, if you, if you look at it this way, it'll probably be better for you, you know? And then all of a sudden you, you maybe have 
you know, uh, 300 kids in an after school program and you've maybe reached, you know, maybe you've reached, uh, uh, you know, 25 or 30 percent of them to where they think, yeah, I can I can do some th- things better if I pay a little more attention in class. And I do do this a little more and maybe there is a future for what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get done. And the idea is to is to change the way people think and that they don't have to be satisfied with being with being just oh there's no way for me because there's no hope because wh- what am I going to do you know and so what you got to do is you got to give people hope and give them a purpose and and then hope and purpose all of a sudden takes you from being in the red zone to the yellow zone and it's the same thing in coaching if you got a player that's a C student a C, a C player, you got to make him a B player. You got a B player, you got to make him an A player. And kind of the people in the green zone, they're going to take care of themselves no matter who coaches them or teaches them. But do you make your money with the people in the red zone and the people in the yellow zone? And so that's where, where I concentrate my money right now is on the, on the, on the people that are in the red zone that need the help to make their lives better. Well, Coach, you've done some great stuff. Uh, the website is the org, And again, for $20, you can get your mask of uh, the Utes, BYU, Utah State, the Jazz, $20 donation to the Rahm McBride Foundation. And uh, you do some wonderful things with all that. And and uh, you've done some just great stuff, Ronnie. I can't say enough. I mean, you came in and you, you built the football program, but you really became a part of this community and uh, done so much for so long. Uh, we appreciate your time and all the best to you and Vicky and your family and everything you're doing. Well, I would, I tell you what, I wouldn't trade my career for, for anything, you know, and, um, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's been wonderful and I've been truly blessed. So, uh, I appreciate my time, my time at the university of Utah, particularly. Great stuff. Ron McBride. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day, man. Appreciate it. For more on Utah athletics, including up-to-date schedules and ticket information, log on to utahutes.com. Now back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Well, how much fun was that? Ron McBride for around 90 minutes on this edition of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. You know, one thing I talked to Ronnie about I want to go back to, you know, it seems like today, you know, one of the the patterns you see in the hiring of coaches is, you know, a lot of ADs want to go after kind of the, the young up and coming guy who could bring a little pizzazz to the program. And McBride was kind of the opposite of that. He was uh, an assistant coach for 25 years in college and high school football before he got his chance to coach at Utah. But he was a guy who'd been around, who built relationships. He knew what he needed to do in terms of recruiting. He was familiar with the LDS missionary program and just had so much to offer this program when he came in. And the thing is, as he mentioned, he was a guy who came here for the long term. He wasn't going to come in like some had done and just try to win quickly in three three to four years and get out. He wanted to stay long term. And in 13 years, six bowl games, 88 wins. What a run he had with the Utes. After he left here, he went on to Weber State and and, uh, did some great jobs with them. In fact, he had them in the... Uh, NCAA FCS playoffs a couple of years. He won the base guy in 2008. And, and uh, ever since then, he's been a huge guy in the community, uh, working with some high school kids as a coach and as a mentor. And as we talked about towards the end, he's got a great program going on now. You can buy the mask with uh, either Utah, BYU, Utah State or the Jazz logos on that mask for $20. It's a donation to the Ron McBride Foundation. The website, once again, www the Ron McBride Foundation.org and stay safe, support your team, and it goes to a great cause. And Ron McBride uh, is a guy who uh, has done so much, continues to do so much for our community. Great to catch up with him. Well, we appreciate you joining the show. Thanks to Mike Gilliland on the technical side. That will do it for us until next time. I'm Mike Ligashult. Thanks for joining us. So long, everybody. This has been Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube.